This is a replay, part of the recorded presentation of Tuckahoe Public Library Presents Financial Literacy, the Pandemic's Impact on the Economy and Financial Markets, presented by Andrew and Chris Wong of Runnymede Capital Management. Please read this disclaimer in its entirety. You should not assume that any of this discussion or information contained herein serves as receipt of or as a substitute for personalized investment advice from Runnymede. It is our great privilege and, and uh, honor to be here tonight to talk a little bit about the pandemic and its impact on the economy and financial markets. Um, it's, it's a responsibility that we take seriously and we very proudly uh, take these opportunities to speak to groups like yours. You have a wonderful library as well as occasionally uh, going on television, which is fun. And you can see what Chris looks like in his nice suit and tie. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. As you heard, Chris is our director of research. He was previously at uh, CREF, the College Retirement Equities Fund, one of the largest pension funds in the U.S., managing a lot of the college professors and academia uh, retirement plans. And Chris came to our little firm in New Jersey, and um, we do a lot of research in-house. We do a lot of homework. And I think that now is a very interesting time. We still feel like it's very important to do one's research to figure out what's happening in the world, where is there risk, and is it a risky time or not a risky time, as well as really trying to uh, understand where are good opportunities today. So Chris, I turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks for everyone taking the time to join us tonight and hear our views on how the pandemic has impacted the stock market and the economy. It's just been a tremendously strange year. Um, there's that uh, Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. And that is certainly the year that we've had. And it, it feels like we've lived through 10 years, I think, this year. So, so much has gone on. And I think a year, if you looked back a year ago and told us that we would live through a pandemic and the stock market would be hitting all time highs, I don't think too many people would take that bet, but that is where we are. And it's uh, been a crazy year. So I do want to walk through quite a few slides. I'll try to move through them pretty briskly so we have enough time to take questions. Um, the first slide I have here is really this colossal collapse in GDP. Uh, because of the pandemic, the economy was shut down in early spring, and we ended up actually having it, having a 10% decline, a uh, peak to trough in GDP. And that hasn't happened in over 60 years. You have to go back to the 1940s into the Great Depression uh, to see a, a, a deeper decline uh, than the one we just saw. And um, if you look at the average duration of these recessions, the average duration is 11 months. Um, I guess the good news is that we are now about nine months into the recession. So hopefully we are nearing the turn um, and we are gonna be coming out of it uh, heading into 2021. But uh, it is a deep, uh, very deep recession that we haven't seen uh, before at least in our careers. Uh, this, is, this is a chart showing the economic recovery. Um, you see in the, the March, April time period when the economy was locked down uh, to try to control the pandemic, uh, the, the economy was essentially 60% shut and you see a gradual uh, return to normalcy of, of reopening the economy. Um, that has kind of flattened out um, in the fall. And now there, there are concerns that uh, because of the winter and rising COVID cases, um, will that number uh, start to pull back, maybe decline a little bit again, if, if we do have to lock down? I think that's gonna be a big question mark. Um, I mean, it, it has been a tough recovery for many businesses. Uh, one statistic was in, in, in August, 90% uh, of New York City restaurants couldn't pay their full rent and almost 40% could not pay anything at all. So there are definitely a lot of risks within this market 
uh, especially with small businesses um, that are struggling to stay alive. And I, I know in, in our neighborhoods, we see a lot of small businesses that have closed and I'm sure you see the same. So hopefully we can get through this period of uh, reopening uh, over the next few months in, in, until we get to the vaccine, which was, which we did see positive news today. I, I will touch on that a bit later in the talk. This is the chart of the stock market. And if you look at this, it really does look like a V-shaped recovery. Uh, the S&P now up year to date over 10%. The black line there is small caps. Even the small caps have now returned to positive territory after today, uh, up 2%. Um, and on the, on the international side, a uh, slight decline, uh, about down 1.8%. Um, the S&P has been driven by a lot of very large cap uh, mega stocks, uh, especially in the tech space, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they have comprised a very large portion of the S&P 500 at about 24% of the S&P 500. It's, so it's a huge concentration in uh, these mega cap names, which um, it hasn't happened to, to be that type of concentration since the year 2000. So you are seeing this trend of big big names dominating the index, um, how long that continues uh, remains to be seen. Um, I think a lot of people have, have questioned why is the stock market um, doing so well when the economy is still not fully reopened? Maybe it's 30% um, still running short of capacity. Um, businesses are struggling. Why is the stock market doing this well? Um, I think there's a couple reasons. Number one is that the stock market does try to look into the future and does try to discount what is going to happen. So it's not necessarily telling you exactly um, what the economy is doing at that moment. And number two is really that the stock market is not the economy. Um, and that's on this slide. Um, one of the sectors that has been really hard hit during this downturn is the airline industry. Obviously, people are not traveling, and the big airlines like United and Delta, they're still running um, a lot of routes, even though people aren't flying. Um, so the airline industry accounts for 7% of jobs in the US and 5% of GDP. But on the other hand, in terms of stock market returns or stock market exposure, they only account or make up 0.23% of the S&P 500. So there's very little impact from the airline industry on the S&P or the stock market, even though they comprise of a very large portion of the economy. So you do have to understand that the stock market does not totally reflect uh, what's going on in the economy and does not make up um, exactly uh, what's going on in the economy. So some of the things that have other factors that have been driving the stock market over this time is really epic, what we call epic fiscal and monetary stimulus. The government, I think, should be commended for taking really um, aggressive action to provide support to our citizens in the US and businesses. Um, very quickly, they, they passed the CARES Act. Uh, this was back in March, April providing a $2 trillion lifeline and stimulus to people that have lost their, that lost their jobs and also PPP money for small businesses uh, to try to help them uh, stay afloat during the shutdown. Um, I, I mean, the, this was a very aggressive action back in 2008 uh, when we had the Great Recession. Stimulus really didn't come in into play into 2009, and that was um, about a year into the recession. Uh, 2008 was a very tough year for the stock market, but uh, the government took its time back then. This time, they were very aggressive, noticing that uh, they did they would need to help backstop the economy when they everything was shut down. Um, and it is a recession, unlike. Uh, one we've ever seen because of the government transfer payments um, providing extra unemployment 
uh, to people that have lost their, their jobs. Um, even though there were about 20 million people unemployed. Um, on the chart on the left, you see the red dash line is GDP and you see that number collapse there. But on the other hand, you saw personal disposable income actually go up. So you saw, saw this huge spike, which is very unusual. Um, you do see, you do typically in recession see people save, but here it was because the government transfer payments were providing stimulus um, in terms of a check of $1,200 to, uh, to people, as well as unemployment, enhanced unemployment benefits, which actually paid many people more than they were making um, when they were working. So you did see this very strange um, divergence between disposable income and GDP. And the chart on the right is commercial and industrial loans versus GDP. In, in a typical recession, you would expect um, companies to deleverage. This is a very unusual time as well as companies actually took on more debt to try to um, reinforce their balance sheets uh, to make sure that they could make it through the, the uh, lockdown and through the, the recession ahead. Um, that was partially backstopped because the Fed uh, took extraordinary measures of deciding to buy junk bonds and corporate bonds. So they allowed companies to uh, really borrow at very low rates and not have to worry about those loans. Uh, this is a chart on monetary policy. Um, we call it easy money from the Fed. The blue line is the Fed balance sheet and the, the amount of assets on the Fed balance sheet. Um, it was another um, epic move, this time from the monetary authorities. Um, back in 2008, the Fed also were, were buying uh, a lot of treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities, but it took them seven years to increase uh, the size of their balance sheet by $3 trillion. Um, this time, in this cycle, it took them three months to add $3 trillion to the balance sheet. So they were very, very aggressive. And they also were buying corporate bonds, junk bonds, and uh, helping to basically keep liquidity in the system and keep everything functioning. So very aggressive action from both the federal government on the fiscal policy and also from the Fed on mon monetary policy. The Fed also dropped interest rates to zero. Um, that was really just to try to help push money into the markets and to keep things functioning. But they do see this, they, they intend to keep this policy through 2023. Um, Goldman Sachs expects to see no hikes through 2025. So that's a long time, this is at least four years ahead of no interest on your savings account. I think that's very bad news for retirees and savers um, who are looking for a safe return um, on their savings. Um, it's really forcing people to look elsewhere for any type of return. And this is what we call, the, there's an acronym called there is no alternative. They're talking about there is no alternative to stocks because on the bond side, you're just earning little to no return on safe assets. So um, as the close of Friday, the 30-year 30 30 year treasury, treasury yield was yielding just 1.6%. And in Europe, the 30-year German bond is actually in negative territory, uh, negative 0.2%. You have to actually pay the government for the privilege of holding your money. In Switzerland, that goes out 50 years. Uh, so it's a, it's a very difficult time uh, for investors who are really looking for, especially investors who are looking for a safe income stream. I think the challenge will be for, for several years ahead of trying to find safe return on your assets because on the bond side, you're just gonna earn very paltry returns. And that's really forcing people to look to increase risk they're forcing people into equities, or if you are looking at bonds, you're gonna to have to go to longer dated, long, longer dated paper, or perhaps 
a lower lower quality paper to earn uh, it's earn earn any type of return. This is just a slide. Um, people, everyone is basically going to have to take more risk. CalPERS is the California pension system, one of the biggest uh, retirement systems um, in the United States, and they said that they are going to actually take on leverage to try to juice up their returns since they can't earn a return on their bonds. They're going to have to try to use leverage to earn a, earn their 7% target return. And uh, that, that does worry us a bit. Um, seeing the system take on more leverage and taking on more risk, um, I think that's just going to build risk into the system. And you might have higher volatility in risk down the line. Looking at the S&P 500, something that we do see as positive heading into 2021. Um, this year obviously was a very difficult year for S&P 500 earnings. In the first quarter, S&P earnings declined 66%. In the second quarter, down 49%, and uh, slightly improving in the third and fourth quarter. But because uh, those were such bad quarters, uh, just from a comparisons perspective, uh, the comparisons are going to be much easier heading into 2021. So in the first quarter of 2021, S&P earnings are forecasted to be up over 120%. In the second quarter, up over 100%. And in the third and fourth quarter, still up over 20%. Those are very strong numbers. And I don't think those numbers even bake in um, potential um, reopening faster because of the vaccine. So. If there is a, a silver lining, I think it's going to be very strong S&P earnings um, in the year ahead. And, and historically, if you look at either individual securities or the overall market, uh, stock prices do tend to follow um, earnings growth. So the year ahead um, does look very, very positive in terms of S&P earnings. Um, people do worry about valuations. Um, a lot of seen a lot of market pundits saying that um, we're in a bubble or the stocks are very overvalued. Um, this chart is looking at 10 year treasury yields inverted versus um, forward PE. That's a valuation metrics measuring price divided by earnings. And if you look at the, those two lines, they look very highly correlated. and what it's telling you is that because interest rates have declined so much that um, people are going to pay more for growth or pay more for um, yeah pay, pay more for growth and so multiples rise um, and even if interest rates stay very low, I think in 2021 since earnings are rising. Prices could rise as well and keeping that multiple just flat. Um, you don't even need multiple expansion to see uh, stock market gains in 2021. So we do feel like valuations are fair. They're not um, in bubble territory like, um, like a year like 2000. I think it is a very different picture. Year 2000, you had a lot of internet companies that weren't earning money. This, year, th this economy is very different. Um, a lot of the companies that did well this year, especially in the tech sector, now do have earnings and do uh, generate lots of cash like Apple um, and Amazon and Google. All those companies are very profitable and generate a lot of, uh, a lot of return for shareholders. So the big news today was that Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, they had very positive data from their phase three trial. Um, how has this been actually possible? I did want to just have this slide. Um, I do give a lot of credit to our government for creating Operation Warp Speed. On the left, you see the traditional path of early development of a vaccine to large scale. In the, in the past, this would take four to six years to develop uh, a vaccine. And it's because a company would have to basically go from step to step and they don't want to take risk very early on in, in, in the development or in fa even phase one. Um, they're not going to start manufacturing. 
and they're not going to start scaling up in terms of manufacturing until they know that um, the data looks good. And that, that's typically in the late middle to late phase two, um, where they would start manufacturing because then they have a much clearer picture and they're, they're more exposed to, well, they're less exposed to risk of uh, their, their candidate failing. Um, so in Operation Warp Speed, the US invested $10 billion in several uh, different vaccine candidates and they are trying to compress this four to six year time uh, process into eight to 12 months. So, I mean, it, it is a quite an unbelievable, um, really, it's an unbelievable undertaking. And uh, I think it's a testament to science and a cooperation, uh, global cooperation between scientists to try to get this to market as quick as possible so people can return to normal. So in this, in this case, um, even at the start of phase one, uh, Pfizer and Moderna and the other uh, vaccine candidates actually started manufacturing uh, much, much earlier, and that is gonna allow them to roll out the vaccine much, much faster. Um, the data today, I think it was just an incredible result. They, were, they showed 90% efficacy, um, the FDA, benchmark or goalpost that they were looking for was above 50%. So uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, they really knocked it out of the park. Um, data still has to come in over the next couple of weeks um, as they track um, all the uh, people in the, the trial. They wanna make sure that after two months that there's no um, severe side effects. But uh, the, the data so far has looked very good through phase one and phase two. and thus far through you know, phase three. So the vaccine is very exciting for uh, the year ahead. Um, in terms of timing, uh, Pfizer does think that they, they, they'll roll out about uh, 50 million doses this year. Um, since it's two doses per person, that would be about 25 million people that they could vaccinate this year. That'll start off um, in healthcare workers primarily and government workers. And in 2021, they have a very ambitious plan to ramp up to over a billion doses. And uh, we expect that to be sometime in mid 2021, hopefully sooner than later, but uh, I think by the summertime, we should start seeing that being rolled out. And Moderna, it is a very similar platform um, an MR, mRNA platform. Uh, so I would expect that to see positive data in the next few weeks as well. And they have also an aggressive uh, dose uh, manufacturing plan, 20 million in 2020 and 50 million to a billion in 2021. So uh, the vaccine front looks very positive. And I think all of us, well, I think it's, it, it, you can kind of question whether is this safe or not. I think the the FDA is looking at these results very closely. This is not a political um, game. They are looking to uh, provide a solution or a, a vaccine for everyone to return to normalcy. So I think we'll all look at the data and make that choice. Uh, I think there's a lot of pent up demand to return to normal in 2021. In terms of pandemic winners and losers, on the left, uh, you see some of the winners that, that we've seen. Um, a lot of it was people staying at home. Um, we're obviously on a Zoom call right now. Zoom has thrived during this time period. We've all got used to using uh, the Zoom platform very quickly. Um, and because we're at home, uh, things like Home Depot, uh, Williams and Sonoma, even restoration hardware, all these um, businesses that have focused on home products have really thrived during this pandemic as people have spent time at home and they wanna uh, fix up their house and do home, home improvement projects with, when they are spending so much time um, with family and being at home so that they're spending a lot of money uh, within the house. Um, also online shopping has thrived during this time period. 
Um, that has benefited FedEx, who has uh, really shipped tons of product around the world. Um, they've seen so much demand that they've actually been able to raise prices. Um, they've acted like uh, it is, it's almost been the surge that they've seen typically through a Christmas holiday season. And that's been all year um, through this pandemic period. Um, at the bottom there is Chewy. Uh, they, they do online pet food service. Um, and during this pandemic, a lot of people have uh, adopted cats or dogs. A lot of the shelters have seen huge demand for uh, pet ownership. We did adopt two cats for our parents to keep them company during the uh, COVID pandemic. And I think you will see a company like Chewy continue to thrive um, going forward. Um, another sector that has done well is are the home builders because um, interest rates are so low. Um, you see DR Horton there. The home builders have thrived. Real estate as a sector has really thrived and seen prices rise to similar levels as the last peak in 2007. Um, that is a combination of uh, very low interest rates, uh, the lowest ever on the 30-year mortgage and 15-year mortgages. Um, people are seeing very attractive opportunities. Um, also, inventories have been low in real estate, so that is also driving up prices. And there's also been this uh, demographic shift as people have, uh, during the pandemic, fled the cities to go to uh, less populated areas and to the suburbs. So you've seen those areas thrive. Um, I also have Domino's Pizza on there. A lot of the pizzerias thrived as the, and delivery services in general of food um, as people were staying at home and not going out to eat as much. On the right are the uh, pandemic losers. Obviously travel, um, the airlines have been hit hard and anything really related to travel and anything related to bigger crowds um, have really seen their businesses hurt. Um, even, even on the retail front, if you have to go into a store, those businesses have, have really struggled. So Hertz, Neiman Marcus, and JCPenney, they've all uh, declared bankruptcy during this time period. You've had many retailers uh, have to file bankruptcy during the time period. Uh, it's been a struggle for small businesses as well as large. But I mean, looking forward, uh, to 2021, I think you do have to do a lot of stock research to say who is going to thrive during the next time period when the vaccine comes out and life is starting to return to normal. Um, there will be new winners and losers, um, but some of the winners will stay winners. Some of the losers may stay losers. Um, we do think a company like Chewy will continue to thrive because um, Pet ownership is here to stay. People still will have their pet and people are used to ordering off of a platform like Chewy instead of going into the store. Um, a lot of their business comes from a, a auto ship function on their website where um, people just will reorder their food on a month to month basis and they don't even have to worry about it. Um, on the other hand, there's something like a company like United. I think travel will rebound, especially on the least leisure side. Um, people do want to travel again and to get back on the road. I think that the challenge with the airlines, um, it's a couple things. Um, number one is that a lot of their profits come from business travel. And I think it's gonna take a longer time for business travel to return to normal. Um, a lot of businesses see that they can save a lot of money by doing Zoom meetings, by having uh, their workers not travel as much. Um, so the airlines will be hurt by the lack of business travel. And it's also uh, this time period where we have to wait for the vaccine to actually roll out. And the big airlines who are running a lot of their planes at very limited capacity, uh, they're losing a lot of money every day. Um, in the tens of millions of dollars. So um, they do have to get through the next six to eight months. And uh, they've been begging for a bailout of more money from the government, uh, which has not come thus far. So, I mean, it, it, like, we, like I said, I think it, it does take a lot of research and 
looking for companies with great management teams and that can adapt to change. And you are going to have to pick what companies are going to be um, here to stay uh, going forward. Here's another uh, chart that I find interesting. It's the S&P performance by, by president. Um, we do have our president-elect now and Joe Biden, uh, but in the lead up uh, in the past month, we have had questions from clients uh, that are worried about um, a particular uh, candidate um, from both sides of the aisle. But the thing I like about this chart is that it has shown that the stock market has really uh, continued to thrive and grind higher. And it didn't matter w whether it was red or blue. And I think that's a testament to our, our US corporations that are very innovative and entrepreneurial. And they found way, they always find ways to thrive and uh, make money. But uh, also because I think the system of government that we have in our democracy, there's a lot of checks and balances. And the I feel like the economy is like an aircraft carrier. And the, if the president is trying to turn it one way or the other, you can only kind of steer it so, so much and so quickly. Um, and there's a lot of checks and balances. So um, no, no president has really had um, a terrible result, except I think if you see there, there was Hoover who had a down market, but that was during the Great Depression. So we'll give him a pass. <laughs> But we do feel like uh, it'll be a, it would have been a positive year uh, for the economy. Uh, it didn't matter who the candidate was uh, who got elected. But we do look forward to uh, see what uh, President-elect uh, Joe Biden has in store for the markets in the year ahead. I do want to touch on a few risks uh, to ponder in the economy. There is definitely risks ahead. Uh, the, there was a lot of economic damage caused by the lockdowns. And uh, the first risk we do, we, we do feel is extremely high unemployment, which continues. Um, on this chart in the black bars, you see jobless claims. That, that has trended down, but uh, part of the reason why recently uh, jobless claims have fallen off is because the, um, Unemployment insurance runs out after 26 weeks. And I believe we're in roughly in the, in the low 30s in terms of weeks into the, into the pandemic. So people are rolling off unemployment insurance so that they fall off the continuing claims and they are being added into the red bars, which is the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. Uh, that's basically still supporting people under unemployment, but that only lasts 13 weeks. So um, a lot of the focus is on uh, what is next for helping people that don't have jobs and considering that a lot of um, small businesses are struggling. Um, I think that the, the people that don't have jobs, they still need support through this time period. Um, until the economy can really fully recover. So the eyes are really on the government in terms of what is the next stimulus plan. Uh, Mitch McConnell did signal that he is ready to uh, hit the negotiating table with Nancy Pelosi. We will see what happens in the next few weeks. Um, I don't think it's going to be uh, the 3 trillion that the Democrats were hoping for um, over the last month or so. Um, but a package of one to one and a half trillion is likely to provide support to small businesses as well as people um, that continue to be unemployed. But uh, I mean, the, the, the risk here is that if people don't have, um, if the stimulus doesn't come through, uh, you start seeing credit risk build up in the um, in the financial system when they can't pay their auto loans or their mortgages or rent or credit cards. So this is a very um, important thing to look forward, to look at going forward and monitor. The other thing <clears throat> that is a potential risk is big tech 
may cause the next wreck. Um, these five companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Microsoft, uh, they are now just a gigantic market cap, almost $7 trillion. That is bigger than the FTSE, which is the, um, the, the FTSE 100, which is the UK's 100 biggest companies, which is only 1.6 trillion. Uh, the DAX is Germany at just over a trillion. So, I mean, the staggering size of the big tech companies um, just poses a risk. As you, as you get that big, how do you continue to grow? And there's also a risk of regulation. Um, the DOJ over the last month filed suit against Google and the FTC just, uh, they just, um, launched an antitrust case against Facebook. So big tech is also facing regulation, um, which could affect growth. Um, so these big companies could face um, additional regulation, which could slow growth. And just from their size, they could see slow growth. So just being a big part of the index, if these companies uh, face the, a decline, the S&P 500 um, would struggle to grow. So I, I think that is a risk into the future. And the last risk I have here is continuing to be COVID. Uh, even though there's a vaccine on the horizon, uh, the COVID cases continue to climb in Europe very, uh, very greatly in recent days. Um, you see that they are well ahead of their spring peaks. And uh, you've you saw you have seen lockdowns and or varying degrees of lockdowns throughout Western Europe, UK, uh, France, Germany, Italy. Everyone's really having to uh, try to lock down again uh, and to try to slow this very steep rise in cases. And if you remember, in in the spring, it was Europe that led the U.S. by a couple of weeks, and it, it felt like we were looking into the, if you were, it was kind of like you were looking into the future if you just looked at Europe. And we hope that this type of trend does not happen in the US. But uh, the worry is as the weather is getting cooler over, the, over here, um, heading into the winter, that cases are on the rise in the US as well. And uh, I think there's a lot of pushback in the US in terms of doing another lockdown and how will we deal with rising cases uh, the chart on the left is the case count and the cases are rising over 100,000 um, per day now. I think the good news is that um, hospitalizations aren't as great as that springtime period and doctors have learned how to deal um, and to treat COVID much better than the springtime. Um, they do, I think they do more uh, they do understand the disease progression and they do have um, some tools in the tool belt to deal with it. So you haven't seen this big spike in death, death rate, but it is definitely a concern that cases are on the rise. And even on the East Coast um, in my town where, small town in New Jersey, where through much of the summer we had zero cases. Um, recently, we there was a few parties at the high school level and all of a sudden our town has 50 cases and growing and you they've had to uh, move this the high school to remote and you've seen this in a lot of neighborhoods um, in the northeast so I think this is a concern and even if we have the vaccine in 2021 we have to make it through the winter uh, which I think is going to be a tough uh, tough few months. Uh, so in conclusion, we do expect the vaccine to be uh, generally available to the public in mid-2021, but we have to get through this winter time period first. Hopefully things don't spiral out of control in the U.S., and hopefully um, we are wearing our masks and socially distancing and uh, can keep things under control. On the positive front, we do expect in 2021 earnings to be strong. We do expect the Fed and other central banks around the world to provide a very easy um, accommodated uh, monetary policy, which would 
uh, provide liquidity to the, to the financial markets. And in terms of stimulus, uh, that is needed to get us through this next nine to 12 months. We do expect to see stimulus not as big as uh, I think uh, President, uh, President-elect Biden would like to have done, which is in the three trillion range, but I think they will get something done um, to provide support to the economy. Um, interest rates, as I described earlier, they are going to remain low, and especially on the short rates, they will stay near zero. So they are going to force people to um, risk assets to try to earn a return. Um, risks on the horizon, if you do feel like it is an asset bubble, historically, we've done a lot of research on protecting our clients from bear markets. And the good news is that bubbles aren't, uh, bubbles are popped by tight mo monetary policy and rising rates. Um, and we, we feel like neither of those are on the horizon. So even if there is a bubble, we do expect that to continue to inflate because you don't see uh, this tightening of monetary policy and rising rates are really not on the horizon right now. So I will leave it there um, and I'll turn it back over for questions, if anybody has questions. Thank you, Andy and Chris. And so before the section, I have a lot of questions, but right, I see you <laughs> answer most of the questions and even provide, provide more information. Yeah, thank you so much.